I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. Sometimes it takes a different approach to help you unlock your true potential. Capella University's game-changing FlexPath format helps you learn at your own pace and fit earning a degree into your life. From before you enroll to after you graduate, you'll be supported by people who are invested in your success so you can pursue your goals knowing that help is available if you need it. Imagine your future differently at capella.edu. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Choose Yourself Network. Today on the James Altucher Show. Our problem is that we, the people, have been systematically misled and mistreated. Why is it legal that there is a third party commerce, which is say company to company, in our most personal, most private data? Why is it legal for credit card processors to sell our transaction data to anybody who wants to buy it? Yeah, why is that legal? I didn't even think it was legal. Why is it legal for banks to sell financial data? By the way, is that legal? Yeah, of course I, it is. Like I'm saying, I don't even know, right? And I talk to people like you all the time. I don't know. Every, no, every, it's, trust me. There are lots of people who buy your credit card data. Why is it legal for your cellular company to sell location data in any form? Why is it legal for anybody online to sell your history? Like, like again, I'm asking the question sincerely. Do they do that? Like They're playing a much bigger game. You really want to look at Google Facebook, Microsoft, Amazon, Verizon, and there's lots of wannabes who want to get in, but those guys are all actually playing in it in a big way today. And they are tracking you everywhere they can. They are gathering data anywhere they can. They're making behavioral predictions about what you're likely to do, and they have products designed to influence your behavior so that you actually do what they're predicting. So, Roger, you're scaring me because I'm not going to give up Google, Facebook, Uber. You don't have to stop using anything, but... What I'm saying here is, look, people are free to judge for themselves whether they like this or don't like this. The problem I've got is people aren't aware of it. These guys are putting cameras or microphones everywhere. The thing you have to understand is that privacy isn't about protecting your identity. Privacy is about protecting your ability to make choices without fear. If you're being watched absolutely all the time, you are not free to make choices. You know, when you go online and they say, we want to find out if you're a robot, and you go to that Google CAPTCHA product where they say, touch all the photographs that have a car or a street light or something like that. And people think, well, okay, let's figure out that I'm a human. I'm going, no, that's not what's going on at all. You're training the artificial intelligence for Google self-driving cars. That's fascinating. So let's call a life, not only your, your body and your actions, but also all this other stuff like your your clicks, your likes, your preferences, and now your mouse movement. It's literally everything. Well, what else? What, what could I not be thinking of as well?
Thanks again, Roger McNamee. Coming back for part two. Uh, you wrote the book Zucked, Early Investor on Facebook. People now know you as being, I, I don't want to say harshly critical, but critical of kind of the misuse of, of data. It's data run rampant now in social yeah. media. And whether the Russians are using it in elections here, the U.S. is using it in elections overseas, advertisers are using it, using data acquired inappropriately, and on and on and on. Well, and James, if I can, just because this is part two, let me give one short recap so people understand where I'm coming from. You know, I spent 35 years being a true believer in technology, and I still believe technology can make the world a lot better place. And, and just to, 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 to summarize that, again, you were an early investor in Facebook. What were some of the other companies you were an early investor well, in? Well, I mean, I began really before the foresight. personal computer industry. So, I mean, I got to be there from the early days of, of you know, companies like like Compaq and Lotus and Microsoft, et cetera, right? Adobe was one I was particularly well associated with and Autodesk going in the distant past, you know, Oracle and, and Dell during their revivals and, uh, you know, Cisco. And, uh, you know, then you go into the, the early days of the internet and it was Netscape and, and, and Google and uh, Amazon and... Uh, uh, so you've been, you've been there, done it. I've been around for a long time and my investors have... have you know, again, this isn't for me. I, I managed other people's money, right? And so it 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 worked out great for me. But the key beneficiaries were, you know, the the pensions and things like that of people who who were invested in my funds. So what stopped me in this whole thing was I saw things in the 2016 election. I saw things during the course of of. 2016 that were around civil rights of people using Facebook's advertising tools to harm innocent people. That really slowed me down. I went to Mark Zuckerberg and Charles Sandberg with my concerns. That's how this whole thing started. Over the last two years, it's morphed a lot. My, I've really dug into it. And what I realize now is that I had missed a fundamental shift in the business model and culture of Silicon Valley I was at the tail end of my career. I was retiring. I was, you know, not as engaged. And the signals were there. And I really, I confess, you know, I, I just, I missed some things I wish I had seen a lot earlier. But now that I see it, I think it's my job to go out there and make people aware. And it's really about this notion that, that Google had an insight that computer technology was essentially unlimited and you could go out and gather all the data that exists in the world and put it through machine learning and artificial intelligence and find signal in it that would allow you to be very economically successful. And it began with the search engine where you know, they would gather data from the users in order to improve the search engine. But what they discovered is they were gathering so much more data than they needed to improve the search engine. They went to see, did it have any value in other uses? And what they discovered was it could be used to predict human behavior. Not necessarily for the person from whom they gathered the data, but about whole populations. And, and they do that for the purpose of, they go to the, you know, they're competing against other forms of advertising like television, billboards, radio. So they want to target better. They want right. to use that data so to target they, better. When they start out, they just have a search engine. They go, well, wait a minute. That's just purchase intent. Let's find out who these people are. So they create Gmail. And with Gmail, they create this insane thing where they go, we're just going to look at the content of every message and gather more data from that. So people basically said, I'm going to have this thing that's public to Google and not only are they going to know my identity, they're going to know exactly what I'm thinking. The behavioral prediction value of being able to read people's email was, you know, it was pretty much 100% targeting. And, and to be fair, it's not like they know everything about Roger McNamee and, and sell Roger McNamee's information to the highest bidder. They put you in a demographic group. That's right. And they, that, they no, sell that group. They put you into a monster bucket, right? And then look for patterns. Like you're sort of anonymous to the uh, well, advertiser. Well, yeah, not, not always. Okay, that's the problem. And, and, but then they add maps, right? And they know where you are. So now they know what your purchase intent was. They know who you are and what you're thinking because of your email. They know where you are. And suddenly they have the most valuable data set for human prediction ever made. And, and not the, only that, Facebook knows all your likes, your preferences. Well, so, fa so Google has all this before Facebook's even found it, right? Yeah. And then Facebook gets started and Facebook hires Sheryl Sandberg, 
you know, I helped introduce her there and make that happen. And so there was cross pollination, pollinization, and off they go. And so that uh, the beginning of it was just better ad products. Then they have the great insight that wow, they could use filter bubbles by you know to sort of fine tune and nudge what people believe, and they could use recommendation engines to tell people what to enjoy or buy to make the behavioral predictions generated by all that data come true more often. So in a sense, make them much more valuable by making them self-fulfilling. So that was the phase two, and that's the phase we've been in the last few years, right? And so, you know, if we think about the effect in the elections, if we think about uh, just how people spend money, you know, filter bubbles and, and recommendation engines have had a profound effect on all of that. And Again, the notion here is not that these are bad people. The notion is that they're really, really smart people and nobody's ever said, hey, wait a minute, there might be a civil rights problem here. Right, because there's good intentions. Like if I buy a book on Amazon and Amazon says, hey, if you like this book, you might like these four books. It's better for me personally if they recommend books I really might like as opposed to random books. That That's true if what they're trying to do is to actually, you know, when it's Amazon, that works pretty well. There are many other cases of recommendation engines that whose intent is not so honest. Right, like so if I like this Facebook group with with people of these opinions, you might like joining these Facebook groups, which might be a little more insidious. Exactly. That the, that's where it's a gray area. Well, well, and and also I would say playlists and things like that are, um, you know, there's much more behavioral modification going on than people recognize, and so. The way to think about this is that that Google then complements all this with Street View, which is those cars that go up and down the streets. And they suddenly are basically taking possession of public places and saying, we're going to turn all these things into marketable data. And we're going to just go up and down your street. We're not going to ask your permission. We're just going to do it and then challenge you to, to say no. And nobody said no, so then they start doing it from the sky. And then they do Google Glass, so they're in your face. And people did say no to that. But then you get things like Pokemon Go, which is basically Google Glass, but using your phone instead. And all this is about digitizing all public spaces and private spaces. And the private spaces are from things like Amazon Alexa and Google Home, where they're now listening in your bedroom or in your office and in lots of places where, honest to God, why we would let a computer listening in all those places is not obvious to me. Do, do you have Alexa in your home? I do not. I had an Alexa for, I bought one on the first day, put it in, plugged it in, and within an hour an ad came on TV because it was the very first day you could buy them, but I pre-ordered it. And the ad goes, hey, Alexa, my Alexa turns on, and I went, oh, my God, this is awful. And I unplugged it and took it out and never plugged it in again. And twice on my tour, I've been in podcasts where somebody had an Alexa in the room, and I got to this port of the thing and just said the word Alexa, and Alexa comes on saying, I don't know what you're asking, and proving the point, right? It is listening all the time. Can, can I ask you this? And this, this is this is like yesterday, uh, I was in a bookstore. I bought a book by Kurt Vonnegut. Later that night, I go on YouTube. I swear to God, I have never searched for Kurt Vonnegut on YouTube. Up came my usual YouTube videos of things I'm interested in and so on. But right in the middle of that, there was a video of a Kurt Vonnegut commencement speech. Yeah. Do you think barcode data is now being thrown right into Google? Definitely. No. So they go out and systematically buy all your credit card transaction data. So whether that has the granularity to produce that, I don't know. They go out and buy all your location data from your cell phone company. They buy any data on health or wellness from apps that are not governed by HIPAA. They buy any data set they can get. And they tr trade for some, they buy some. And it's not just Google. Facebook does the same thing. And, you know, Google's got this thing called Sidewalk now where they're going in and trying to essentially privatize cities or portions of cities. And they got into a big stink in Toronto. What, what does it mean? What are they doing? Well, they're basically sitting there and trying to run urban environments like a business. So they go in and say, we'll take over this development project. We'll put in free, I mean, they even have it in New York. We'll put in free Wi-Fi. We'll put in free uh, computer stations that are notionally about breaking the digital divide. But what they're really about is having all these stations and then snooping on all the Wi-Fi traffic that goes by and, and whatever it is you type into the computers while you're there. 
And with sidewalk, it's it's more about they're going to do a development project in a city. In Toronto, they were going to take a piece of uh, of waterfront area and, and develop it. And then Google basically goes in and says, look, we are going to control all the data. We want a piece of the tax revenues, and we're going to make all the decisions. We're going to replace the, the city in the government role. And, and obviously, this was the first uh, attempt on one of these, and Toronto pushed back, and, and I'm not quite sure where that's going to wind up. But what I'm saying here is, look, people are free to judge for themselves whether they like this or don't like this. The problem I've got is people aren't aware of it. You know, when you go into a um, magazine online and they say, we want to find out if you're a robot, and you go to that Google CAPTCHA product where you see, they say, touch all the photographs that have a car or a street light or something like that. And people think, well, okay, let's figure out that I'm, that I'm a human. I'm going, no, that isn't what's going on at all. You're training the artificial intelligence for Google self-driving cars. They figured out you're a human based on your mouse movement. Now, let's think about what that means. What that means is that they're creating files of your mouse movement over time. And let's roll forward. We've gotten a little bit older. Suddenly, our mouse movement's getting a little slower. See, it's getting a little shaky. And let's just say on day one, your first Parkinson's symptom. Who's likely to know that first, you or the person who's tracking your mouse movements? Hmm. The person tracking your mouse movements is the answer. And here's the problem. They're under no legal obligation to tell you, and they're not governed by the health information rules called HIPAA, so they're also not required to keep it private. They're currently able to sell it to the highest bidder. In the United States, I would suggest that, that highest bidder is most likely to be your insurance company, which is most likely to either get rid of your coverage or raise your rates. That's fascinating. So I never even thought about uh, my mouse movements being part of my, let, 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 let's call a life, you know, not only your, hmm. your body and your actions, but, but also all this other stuff like your, your, your clicks, your likes, your preferences, and now your mouse movement the way you set your it's, temperature it's in your literally house. everything okay and and well what else what, what could i not be thinking of as well? Like, well like mouse movements i never thought of well the other thing you don't think about is you do a transaction right you don't think about what are the hundred things you do before it and the hundred things you do after that's almost certainly how they got your kurt vonnegut right that you know you hit a bunch of things that that gave an indicator that you're interested in kurt vonnegut and you you, you didn't you don't associate it with online right you know, because it occurred somewhere else in some of the right. contacts. But they're they're tracking you no matter where you go. Okay. And so, you know, if if there was any touch to Kurt Vonnegut, I mean, they may just have gotten lucky. Because remember, you're only gonna notice it in a rare set of circumstances. They may be trying that on you fifty times with That's other true. with other novelists and that you just it, and they were wrong, right? You know, they may have gone Thomas Pynchon on you and you go, nah, not not for me. You know, read that stuff on I was younger, but not anymore. And I mean, they're no, by not, no means perfect. But the, 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 the observation I would make is they've taken great pains, especially Google, to pretend as though they're doing something else. They know there's something deeply creepy about what they're doing. And they know there's something that, that if we really had a public conversation, they might not win. And my job here is to make sure we have the public conversation. So I look at this and say, to be, look, you can agree with me, you can disagree with me, that's fine. But let's have a conversation because there is massive political power we're talking about here. That these businesses, because of the nature of what they do, have massive political power. They weren't elected and they're not accountable. And here's what the issue is. If you think about this as uh, you know, a marketplace, traditionally, sellers knew relatively little about us and we knew relatively little about the seller's economics. The result was you would have a fair negotiation between the two sides where each side would stick to its strengths and you'd find, you know, you'd either get to a price or you wouldn't. Now you've got the situation of an information asymmetry where the sellers have perfect information and they've isolated the buyers in their own Truman show so that there's no market power on the buyer's side at all. And, and not only that, there's no analysis of the selling technique. So let's just take your example. 20 years ago, if Coca-Cola was selling something to you, 
ad week would analyze their advertising campaigns. I'm just making this as a one general example, but now brands can directly target you and there's no way for a kind of advertising media or, or, you know, messaging media to understand the message that's being catered just to you because there's maybe billions of messages being sent to billions of people. And, 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 and that's the key point is they're eliminating all the bargaining power of the buyer. So they're taking essentially all the risk and they're price optimizing everything. So you're in that situation where Google can scan Gmail messages. And let's just say that today they're looking, and I don't know if they're doing this anymore, but I think this has always been possible, that you've just gotten a, an email that a family member has died and you need to be in L.A. tomorrow night. And you don't live in New York. You live in, let's say you live in Syracuse. So you've got relatively few options coming up of airlines and times. And who's Google going to sell that information to? They're going to sell it to the airlines. Right. And the airlines are going to be able to, do, to price discriminate based on the fact that they know there's this really narrow window. So if they know you're you when you come in, the prices you're going to see may well be different than would be if you were anonymous. So I have a question because you're... you're You've been deeply involved in in capitalism and building up the the, the technological yeah, revolution. This is we, not capitalism. No, no, but but what I what I'm I'm going to segue into is, you know, wouldn't um, the 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 gentler hand move in at this point and say, okay, an airline could be hostile and buy this data to price discriminate and charge higher prices. So I'm going to create a competitive product that's going to find these people and offer great deals because I'm going to compete with the more hostile old yeah. school airlines. That, so that, won't capitalism kind of come in place and be... That would be true if Google and Facebook didn't control access to all the customers. See, the, I, the, 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 I was always under the impression that you just described, right? And again, I've been at this 35 years, so I was at the tail end of my career. I wish I'd been paying more attention. And my notion was if these guys ever misbehaved with the data, somebody would come in. The problem is they now control the audience for everything. And that gives them massive market power. They started with media, right? They started with journalism in particular, but they were rolling into all these other media types. I mean, you can see the impact of, of Amazon in particular relative to, to various media that aren't journalism, so books and movies and all of that. Uh, then... Now you can see them going after automobiles, right? And the car companies all think they're going to get in on this game, that they're going to become data gatherers and they're going to have all this power. But what they're really going to be is like an appliance that just gathers data for Google and, and Amazon, right? And you can see that they might go to energy and then banking, right? I mean, they, they have the data advantage, right? I mean, Wall Street's got all these really smart mathematicians, but... <laughs> you think they're going to be able to compete with Google on data? I sure so, don't. So you're basically saying they're going to know us so much better than we know ourselves, and they're going to be able to mine this no, data cleverly. I think, I think, no, I think they're going to be able to control the information you have. It's not about them knowing us better. It's that they're going to be able to determine what you know because they control so much information. By the way, this is precisely what the robber barons did at the beginning of the 20th century. The, 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 they're following the same playbook, which is the robber barons came in and there were two things in the environment that had never been like commoditized or monetized. One of them was land, which, you know, basically white people took from the Native Americans and then passed from parents to children. And then you had work, which had historically been bartered for goods. And they turned that into real estate and labor. They priced it, they commoditized it, and they got really rich and controlled the world doing it. And they, they basically started, you know, Morgan and banking and Rockefeller and oil, you know, and then you had Vanderbilt and transportation. And you had people who basically used these things and they pyramided them up and they were just marching their way through the whole economy. And then what's going on with Google and then uh, Facebook, now Amazon, Microsoft, Verizon, and maybe others, is they saw a free good out there, which was all of this data that was in the public square, in our homes, in our heads. And they said, we can get control of that and we can profit from it by 
offering these seductive and convenient services that give us not only access to the data, but more importantly, the ability to manipulate people's attention and then over time to modify their behavior. So, so the, there's pros and cons, right? So self-driving cars, you know, pick me up, take me to work. I can work along the way. My productivity increases and so on. So there's well, a pro. Hey, the, is, the issue isn't self-driving cars. The issue is the business model behind them. I, okay. I the issue isn't search. It's not social. It's that it's this invasive surveillance driven business model. Right. So that's, that's the cons. So they're offering all these services that we think improve our lives. So we'll say, sure, I'll take a self-driving car. Sure. I'll use a search engine. And the, the insidious backdrop is that there's more and more data that I'm not even aware of that they're collecting about me and selling to the highest bidder. No, no, they're manipulating your, what you. They and, manipulate and they're manipulating your, what I think. No, what you're, well, they are manipulating your information flow, right? They're isolating you in, in in this narrow box where each person has the information flow optimized to extract maximum value out of them, and they're using convenience. But here's the thing, and the, because they've, I believe they've overplayed their hands. So as bad as this sounds. I think it actually makes the politics much easier. When it was just Facebook, I was having the hardest time figuring out how we're going to fix this. But now it's really clear that there's an entire economic model here that is essentially the same basic economic model that the robber barons had. Hmm. I think we just run the Teddy Roosevelt playbook, right? This is literally trust busting 2.0. And the great thing is, Remember what happened, right? The robber barons told you, oh, no, no, if you stop us, right? They had social Darwinism. If you stop us, you stop innovation. Well, I'm sorry, but that is not what happened, right? In fact, when you got rid of the monopolies, the economy grew like crazy in this amazingly diverse way. And, you know, you had the Depression, you had the Second World War, but you could not have won the war without the way you went after the Depression, and you could not have had the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s without what came before it. And so my observation about this is that diversifying the economy is just an inherently good thing. That the problem we have today, socially, economically, and politically, is that the benefits are accruing to this tiny percentage of the population. And the vast majority of the population are basically, you know, they say in advertising, you're the product, not the customer. In this model, you're the fuel. Right, you're you're ninety, and so my basic thing is I watched what Elizabeth Warren did at South by Southwest, and Amy Klobuchar following shortly behind her with this notion that we're going to use the antitrust laws the way they were intended, and there's been the criticisms of that have been oh well they don't really understand the history of technology, and I go the people who are saying that I think maybe misreading what the goal is here, right? The goal is to have a finely tuned engineering solution. The goal is to stop a really horrific business model. And you need like 50 different things. No one thing is going to solve it. But antitrust is a really good way to create an open space for new competitive ideas to come to market. So so let, let me ask you this. Like, A, in general, it's been hard for any force to to slow the the growth of innovation, the growth of companies like Google and Facebook and Amazon. No, and it's so not innovation. I'd say these guys are killing innovation. Right, but but they're doing it in an innovative way by by getting by mining the data in in more and more clever ways. Sorry, that they're doing it in a way that innovates for them. Right, but 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 combined with they made a better search engine, so you use them. They made a better recommendation engine, so you use them. They made a better social network, so you use them. And then, you know, self-driving cars, Nest thermometers. But we, hang on. We don't know that that's the limit. I actually believe if they, if they hadn't choked off the access to customers for startups, we'd have had much more interesting social networks by now. Mm-hmm. We'd have had, no, I actually, James, I'm going to push back really hard on this. I so, watched so, them choke off lots of incredibly innovative ideas. What do you mean? How did they choke off? But so in some cases, they simply choke off access to capital. They go to the people who invest in these things and go, we're going to crush this thing. You should not invest there. Mm-hmm. I mean, they've basically created these, these no go zones around their businesses. And, you know, by the way, that's okay. This is America. They're allowed to do that. I'm just saying, from a policy point of view, that's not good for the country. And 
the thing I would say here is it's really worthwhile to study the economic history of the 20th century to, to see the parallels because they are really, really clear to me. And as, a, as an investor, I've depended on history to provide uh, frames of reference for various things going on. And the notion that a, an economy that depends on half a dozen monopolists for innovation is going to be more innovative than an economy that has thousands of companies doing things, there's literally no evidence to support that notion at all. That is an assertion, and it's literally the identical assertion to the one that J.P. Morgan and, and uh, uh, John D. Rockefeller and all the robber barons put forward at the beginning of the 20th century. So, so this, this, I, it wasn't true then. I don't think it's true now. So there's two, two types of questions. One is, what's a kind of societal solution that you believe in? And the second is, today, right now, how can I benefit? How can I change my life to benefit in one way or the other so, from what's happening? So James, I believe that we have enormous power because the issues I'm talking about are issues of right versus wrong, not right versus left, okay? And that this is really about the disenfranchisement of 319 of the 320 million people in America. Mm -hmm. And that everybody knows they're getting the short end of the, of, of the stick here, and they're just not sure which part of it's causing that. So here's what I want to do right now, and this is what I think everybody should do, is recognize we have a 2020 election coming on. This should be one of the core issues, and it should, be, it should apply at every level of government from top to bottom. So from your local all the way up to president of the United States. And we need to ask some questions. And I wanna start with one really basic one, then some subordinate questions. Why is it legal that there is a third party commerce, which is say company to company, in our most personal, most private data? Why is it legal for credit card processors you know, Experian and Equifax and TransUnion to sell our credit card transaction data to anybody who wants to buy yeah, it. Yeah, why is that legal? I didn't even think it was legal. Why is it legal for banks to sell financial data? By the way, is that legal? Yeah, of course I, it is. Like I'm saying, I don't even know, right? And I talk to people like you all the time. I don't know. Every, no, every, it's, trust me. There are lots of people who buy your credit card data. Lot, so we just discovered, thanks to the Wall Street Journal, that there are health and wellness apps that sell health and wellness data. If they were working at a hospital, they would not legally be allowed to do that. But, but are they allowed to sell my data to an insurance company? Like here's James Altucher's mouse movements to an they, insurance company? Well, we know they sold it to Facebook. We don't know who else they sold it to, okay? okay? Why is it legal for your cellular company to sell location data in any form? Why is it legal for anybody online to sell your history? Like, like again, I'm asking the question sincerely. Do they do that? Like, I don't get messages from Starbucks saying, hey, you walked in but walked out without buying something. We'll give you a 10% discount next time you walk in. Like, I don't get those kinds of ads, which I expect I would get if they were selling my I, I, I think you're thinking about the problem wrong, okay? Mm -hmm. And you're thinking about the buyer wrong, okay? Mm -hmm. they're, they, they're playing a much bigger game than just luring you back into the store. These days, we're all investors, trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill 
and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his, you can now find Community Plays under the Promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the Prize Picks community each week. Look, Prize Picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. For football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize Picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But People in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a Masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Memberships start at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one classes with all 180-plus masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180-plus masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So... This holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. Starbucks is an edge player in this thing. You really want to look at Google, Facebook, Microsoft, Amazon, Verizon, and there's lots of wannabes who want to get in, but those guys are all actually playing in it in a big way today. And they are tracking you everywhere they can. They are gathering data anywhere they can. They're making behavioral predictions about what you're likely to do, and they have products designed to influence your behavior so that you actually do what they're predicting. And the point I'm saying here is the root cause of this thing is there is a free third-party commerce in your most intimate private stuff. And now that you have Amazon Alexa and Google Home, it's going to be in the audio of the stuff that you do in your most private places. I mean, it is completely nuts. 
okay? And we need to have, they just asserted that that's okay. And I'm sitting there going, excuse me, we've been deregulating like crazy <clears throat> since 1981. And this is where it's left us, okay? Which is there are no rules and companies all over the economy. It's not just these guys. I mean, remember when Tillerson was the CEO of Exxon, they had their own foreign policy where they were trying to do deals with Russia while we had sanctions going on, right? I mean, you know, the banks basically blew up the economy in 2008 and 2009 with no consequences. I mean, I'm looking at this and going, we have allowed our economy to move past capitalism into this place that is now. I don't even know what to call it. And, but it's, it's not benefiting enough people. So, so, so you, I, I agree they're all tracking the data and the evidence becomes more and more clear every day. I guess the, the problem is that they then sell the data to the highest bidder. Or, maybe or even they exclusively. use it to manipulate you. The point is, remember, Google's not selling your credit card data. They're buying your credit card data, right? Facebook's not selling your location data. They're buying your location data, right? And so what's their nefarious end? They're trying to manipulate your behavior because they're in a situation where they block any other marketer's access to you. Facebook and Google have aggregated the entire world, okay? Any marketer who wants to reach people has to go through them. So there is enormous power in having all the data and being able to isolate you in an echo chamber where you cannot get any bargaining power by working with other people, okay? Where they can show you a unique set of facts or what they call facts in order to have you stay in this isolated state. So, so like, what's what's an example where they're going to use it in a way that because because again, I think people don't realize 2016 election, right? So the 2016 so 2016 election. election essentially because of Facebook and Instagram and Twitter and Google, it was possible to have in the United States theoretically, you know, 320 million separate campaigns, each person isolated separately. And at the end of the day, the genius of Stephen Bannon, the genius of Cambridge Analytica, the genius of the Trump campaign was that they were able to use that to suppress the votes of suburban white women, people of color, and idealistic young people by hitting their trigger points in ways that literally had nothing to do with the issues that were before us as an election. But they were emotional trigger points in those people that you could get at because these products had so much information and because it was possible to isolate these people in information silos where there was nothing to debunk the disinformation that was being thrown at them. I mean, the beautiful thing about 2018 was that those same communities didn't react the same way to disinformation. So, you know, people can learn. But, but people can learn to an extent, right? So the whole premise of Kahneman's thinking fast and slow and his Nobel Prize is that ultimately we don't have free will. Cognitive biases, even when we're aware of them, will 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 manipulate our opinion no matter what. Uh, and so there there is a limit to how much we can take back control of our free will, uh, given the right. data that's but, in front but, of us. But we shouldn't be surrendering our free will to a couple of corporations. I agree. So 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 again, um, what do you think is a possible solution? And 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 right now, how can I? Benefit what I'm one saying way or the is other. The, 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 the simplest solution is to make this an issue in 2020 and to take away that third party stuff, make it illegal, make it criminal to transact in people's private data. And the reason you do that is because that puts you in a position to have a negotiation about what are the appropriate uses of data. The problem is these guys have asserted they can do whatever you want. And so when you do a negotiation from that position, you wind up with what Europe has with the Global Data Protection Regulation or California has with its privacy bill, where you solve 1% of the problem because you're only dealing with the data you put into the system. You're not touching any of the data they buy. You're not touching the metadata, which is the data about the data, which is where all of the advertising value comes from. So when you get, you know, when Zuck comes out and does his thing manifesto a week ago, he's he's spouting total nonsense because he's basically saying, oh, I'm going to end to end encryption, which basically frees him up for liability for all the hate speech and all the harm that's being done. At the same time, he's basically not even mentioning where 99% of his value comes from, which is all the tracking and all the other stuff. And he, here here's the problem, because like, I when you watch the Zuckerberg or uh uh, testimony, 
the senators are asking or the congressmen are asking such basic questions. Hang on. He's it, almost able to make fun of them. I got to push back on you. The mm -hmm. only reason you have that impression is because the FBI raided Manafort's home in the second hour. So you didn't get to see any of the House stuff, which was okay. magnificent. We've just elected 40 new members of Congress, I think, who are under the age of 40, who are digital natives. This Congress is not going to be our problem, okay? Mm -hmm. Our problem is that we, the people, have been systematically misled and mistreated. And we are, we like what the products do. Right. And we've confused that with like, we feel like in order to fix this problem, we have to give up what we like about the products. But it's nonsense. What my point here is, there is literally a substitute for everything Google creates today. It may be slightly less convenient, but there is a substitute. And many of those substitutes do not do this, right? I mean, DuckDuckGo is a search engine that does not keep your data, right? right? And Apple in its ecosystem has all these products that do not keep your data, right? Apple Maps does, you know, they blow everything up. That's part of the reason why Apple Maps isn't quite as good as Google Maps, right? Siri processes on your phone to protect you, you know, uh, Apple's facial recognition processes on your phone so there's no centralized database of, of people's faces. You know, there are, there are people doing good stuff. There are alternatives. I mean, being on an Android today is basically saying, I give up. And I'm going, you don't have to do that. You have all kinds of things you can do. And I asked a question to a group of technologists in New York uh, um, the other night where I said, how long do you think it would take to replace Facebook if you simply vaporized it today? You know what the over-under was? What? Two weeks. Huh. And by the way, that two weeks is not to actually replace Facebook. That's to know which product of the 50 that would start the first day was the one everybody would go to. Well, because if you think about it, you could just basically create a version of WordPress we're not where going everybody's to, connected We're and not going friends. to give up the functionality we love, Okay this is not going to make your life worse. It's going to make it a million times better. Do not be afraid to take back your rights. So what should someone do today to, to take control? And you need and, to get to involved. understand a little bit more. You need, well, so the simple things, I mean, I wrote Zucked to give you the, um, the, the tools to take care of yourself. But you blew my mind with the mouse movements. Yeah. Like the fact that there probably is a hundred pieces of data I'm giving for free that I have no clue of that could actually change the except direction it, of my it, life. It's, it's, except it's hundreds of thousands of pieces of data. Yeah. Okay. And the, the thing you have to understand is that privacy isn't about protecting your identity. Privacy is about protecting your ability to make choices without fear. If you're being watched absolutely all the time, you are not free to make choices. And that's what's wrong. These guys are putting cameras or microphones everywhere. And that should not be allowed without a massive political conversation first. And so my goal is we go to our members of Congress, we go to our, our mayors, we go to our governors, and for sure anybody who runs for president, we go, where do you stand on this issue? Let's roll the sucker back. Let's, let's say December 31st of this year, no more third-party transactions, not trading, not buying, not anything, not using our private data. So I want to use an Uber, I give Uber my address, but Uber has to then vaporize it, right? They're not allowed to keep it. Which, or by the way, say, I'm sure they sell to Google or somebody because no, I, no. I get the Google Maps email. Sorry, you just they went use, home. You just they use this. Google Maps, right? I mean, they use the Maps API. I mean, so if, of course, I mean, of course they do. I mean, that's the problem, right? Is that all this stuff is swimming around in this place where you're not aware of it and you can't touch it and you have no control. I'm just saying... We're, we want to set a date and it all ends and that will focus their attention. You know, they say nothing focuses the attention like a hanging, right? We're going to take all of this away and then we're going to have an honest conversation about what are the circumstances under which we, the people, think it's okay to trade our data where each of us has a vote about our own experience because the problem here is not what they're doing with your data. Your data is already out there. The problem is what, what my data does to affect your life. It's the problem is that they get the data on literally everybody all the time and they can move whole populations. And we don't think about that. When they talk about data dividends, right? It's, it's the wrong, and it's, you're solving the wrong problem. Okay, how's your data changing my life? And then I know we have to wrap up. 
I'm saying that it, that it allows them. So if I buy a car, okay, and I have done 200 steps before I buy the car, 10 of them are obviously about buying a car, but it turns out there's predictive behavior in all of the stuff that's going on before. Well, like they, I might have bought a baby stroller before I started looking by buying a car. They, 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 buy, they, buy, they gather all that data, they look for the patterns, and then they start looking for people who start down a similar path. Yeah. And then they start to manipulate them, and they manipulate you not just to buy a car, but to buy the car that is most valuable for them to sell. If they catch you early enough, they're gonna get you into Mercedes instead of into a Prius. So is Mercedes doing interested in that, or is no, no, Google no. interested Google's in that? Google's interested in it, and then they sell it to Mercedes. I mean, Mercedes wants to wants their cut of the action. Because Google knows Mercedes is the highest bidder. Right. So, so And so they're going to sell it to whoever the highest bidder is. So, so Roger, A, you're, you're, I'll tell you why you're scaring me, because I'm not going to give up Google, Facebook, Uber, Alexa. These things do make my life better, and I know I'm giving away all my data. I'm not going to stop using my credit card, even though they sell it straight to you Google. You don't have to stop using anything. We need to use our political power, okay? What I'm saying to you is use your voice. You have a podcast. Right. You have people who listen to you. Help them understand that you are not only not powerless in this, there are at least 319 million of us in the United States of America who, if we act in our collective self-interest, will be able to keep all the things we like and eliminate the stuff we do not like. These companies will still be profitable without doing what they're doing. By doing what they're doing, they're the most com powerful companies on earth. They're the most profitable companies on earth. And my basic point is Mark Zuckerberg and Larry and Sergey at Google are one good night's sleep away from the epiphany that fixes this. And the epiphany is this, that they can do more good for the world by reforming the business model and culture of their companies than they can ever do with a foundation. So what's the first thing Larry Page should do tomorrow? I, if I were he, I mean, if I want to do it, I would vaporize the data banks. I would, I would you know, I would, uh, you know, just commit myself to having a bunch of individualized services with, add targeting that's appropriate to each individual and get out of the behavioral prediction business and get out of the behavioral manipulation. But that's business. part of the ad targeting. Ad it targeting is. is mixed with behavioral mod uh, modification. So that's right. And you're going to have to find a balance. My point is that's a political negotiation, okay. right? And to be clear, I do not expect them to make this move voluntarily, right? I mean, we've been trying for a few years. Have you thought about taking political office somehow? I can't imagine that anybody would vote for me. Why? My, my job is who they're voting my, for. my job is to be an activist and to make people aware. Okay, and I'm out there doing that. And you know, it, it, I mean, it's funny thing. What would I run for? I'm represented by one of the greatest members of Congress, Anna Eshoo. Right? I mean, I do not. You know, I, I you know, I'm obviously not qualified to run for anything. So. This should be maybe like a secretary of privacy in the cabinet. Well, you know, God bless, right? All right, Roger, you're you're breaking my heart again because we're going to have to do a part three at some point. You know, I'm okay with that. And James, I love Keep these conversations. Back. And the thing is, everybody should understand, we really do have the power here. I mean, the way you're framing the thing is not the right way to look at it. We're not going to have to give up the apps we like. That's not a, what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is we need to go in and use political power against a political problem. Okay. So my, the, 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 the cheapness of these products, though, is subsidized, is subsidized by the data and, and the money they're making Hang on that. Hang on. Look at their profit margins, dude. Let's say we take their profit margins down by 90%. Do you think they're going to stop doing this? No. The history of humanity is that's not how it works, okay? Mm -hmm. And they are the most profitable companies in history. And we just need to make them less profitable and more responsible. All right, well, Roger, when are you coming back into town? I don't know, but you'll be the first to hear. Excellent. Thank you so much, Roger, back and me. Again, I, I honestly have 100 more questions, but I'm glad we, we learned more today than last time as well. And if you want to read the book, it's called Zucked, Waking Up to the Facebook Catastrophe, available anywhere. And, but you know, you're expanding it so much further now, too. We, yeah. we talked no, about No, no, but, but, but the book is meant to be a starting point, yeah. right? There's an amazing book by Shoshana Zuboff at the Harvard Business School called The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. That I is, just saw that yesterday. This extraordinary book. It's really deep. It's really dense. But if you want to understand the underlying mechanics of what Google's doing, she's been tracking Google since 2002. It, is a, uh, it should win every prize. It's an epic book. Well, Roger, I'm scared. 
Thanks a lot. Don't be scared. <laughs> I am. Get active, dude. This is we're coming um, in political fear season. Motivates activism. Okay. Well, let's all get active in our self interest. Okay. Thanks, Roger. Love you, brother. Powered by Snapdragon, the Samsung Galaxy S23 Ultra elevates your photography to epic new heights. Snapdragon processors deliver a color experience like no other with sharp, industry-leading 8K video capture. You can also snap images in 200 megapixels, capturing more detail than ever. And those late-night blurry pics are a thing of the past thanks to next-level night mode. Experience powerfully moving premium photography only with Snapdragon. Follow us on Instagram at Snapdragon Official.